But when the judges came out against it, I was, I was at first a little confused because in my mind, this would make their lives easier because you're basically taking away this, what I would call tax collection responsibility from them and letting them do the work of, of you know, administering justice in the courts of Montana. But it was, a, it was shocking, frankly, how vehemently opposed they were to this tiny statutory change that would allow people to keep driving to and from work. And the, the opposition message that they used really devolved over time to, the, to a point where I was just like, I, you are not interested <laughs> in the well-being of the people that are in your courtrooms. And it started as like, a, this, is a, this is a tool to motivate people to communicate with us. And you know, we said, oh, that's, that's true. But you have all these other tools. Here's 10 other tools I can list for you that you can use to get people to communicate with your courtroom. And then they said, oh, well, this is a, this is a motivator to get people to pay. And I said, well, you know, that, that's not really your, your problem. I mean, I'm sorry that the counties need to generate revenue, but they shouldn't be doing it on the backs of working poor people. And, um, Here's all these other ways that people could serve their sentence, community service, et cetera. And then it just turned right to, this is a power that we have and you're not gonna take it away from us and these people deserve to be punished. And at that point, I was just like, well, <laughs> I don't know what to do about you guys anymore. But it kind of ended up, at, at the end of the day, it shot them a little bit in the foot because the angrier they got, the less articulate they became. And then our message about fairness started to trump their message about um, you know, righteous anger. So. That's what happened with the judges. But they really, I mean, they killed the bill. They killed the bill in the Senate. Um, I won't go into the procedural maneuvers we had to sh shimmy ourselves through to get this thing across the finish line. But they, they had us beat there for a while. But at the end of the day, um, our message won out. And one of the reasons our message went out is because of the Senate president. So Senate president, um, I'm just gonna, he who shall not be named. Uh, he's running for Secretary of State in Montana right now. But he, uh, really hated this bill. And I'm not sure if he hated it because it was an ACLU bill. I'm not sure if he hated it based on principle, but he hated it. And he was one of the main reasons it got killed in the, in, on the, Senate, in the Senate committee before we ended up pulling it out of there. But his message was similar to some of the angrier magistrates, um, which was, uh, in my mind, boiled down to poor people deserve what they get. And it is their fault. And there are not outside reasons why people can't afford to pay bills. And he got up on the Senate floor during the debate about this bill and yelled, um, get off your ass and get a damn job. And I think that turned some people off <laughs> because we were using positive messaging the entire time. And I can't stress enough how important messaging is in this fight, that this was about fairness, this was about dignity, this is about people having access to work, having access to a license, being able to take care of their families. And the message that, that ended up being the last one for the opposition at the end of the day was that poor people deserve what they get. And that didn't work out well for them. And our bill came off the Senate floor and got signed by the governor. So um, I'm not, I mean, I think the Senate president, because of his power, really used, he used his power to, to beat that bill. But at the end of the day, um, his message wasn't resonating and his um, unwillingness to, to see the good in this bill ended up bringing a lot of people to our side. So, Great. So I'm just going to close out Montana with you, David. I know that fiscal notes are a pretty big problem for a lot of groups when they're pursuing legislation. And I understand that you ended up having a pretty significant fiscal note. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why that wasn't such a big problem for you guys? Oh, I mean, it was a problem. We, in the sense that it, it represented a point of barrier to overcome. Uh, and with everything that goes with politics, it's about relationships. So. When we saw that fiscal note, the first thing we thought was like, well, where did this thing come from? It, it, $2 million or something like that? It was, it was crazy. Maybe. And, yeah, maybe yeah, maybe. And it wasn't on like any of the light items on top where it actually has like sums and an Excel sheet. It was a note with like an asterisk at the bottom like, hey, by the way, this could cost us $2 million as if it was like buying extra stamps or something. Um, so they, the, the real the interesting thing was, so the DMV had this new program they were putting in, yada, yada, yada. Um, and they were attaching this to lots of things. So what we did is we worked ahead of the curve. So when it was way before it ever got to the Senate side, I was meeting with the Senate president, uh, the Senate um, uh, majority leader, uh, the leader of the um, finance uh, committee saying, hey, by the way, have you seen this crazy fiscal note? And, and they're like, wow, that's crazy. I've never seen that before. And then, you know, just kind of 
laying that foundation work early, laying that relationship work early so that when it came across, it didn't come across as too big of a surprise. Uh, and then lastly, SK uh, pulled some uh, great last minute on the ground you know, maneuvers in, or, in that committee to argue very clearly in the language of the right why that fiscal note didn't make sense. And that, that carefulness of saying, I'm gonna articulate this in terms of, look, this is an agency that's just trying to protect their bottom dollar, make sure that their whole new system goes well, and, not, and, not, and, and articulating that carefully in a way that someone who's you know, a conservative Republican that runs that chair committee go like, oh yeah, I get that. And uh, so yeah, that messaging point is so huge. Uh, lastly, when it came to uh, you know just just dispersing information, having those key people on the Senate floor get those those one pagers that say on it. Oh, by the way, that fiscal note's ridiculous at the bottom, and here's why. Um, and that you know clearing the right way ahead of time with the right people in leadership already know this is not going to impact the budget. We all know this; it's just a game. Uh, so yeah, that was that was the biggest one. That's perfect. Thanks so much to both of you. I'm now going to be turning to my left here, and we're going to start off with you, Amy. So, Amy, we've already heard quite a bit about the work that's been happening in Virginia. And you have mentioned that a left-right coalition was essential to the success that you have had thus far and to the success that hopefully you will be continuing to have. Would you mind just explaining what this coalition was and why it was so important? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having us here, first of all, and actually the answer to my question in part um, is thank you, Thea, because working um, with the coalition is really what brought us in partnership with Americans for Prosperity Virginia to work on repeal of license suspension in that state. Our story sounds a little bit like Montana's, actually, and I think what it points to and, and um, how easily that partnership came together and how easily it made sense sort of points to the fact that this is a fundamental common sense issue. It doesn't take people long to sort of figure out why we're trying to do what we're trying to do and what our goals are when you explain it. Um, in Virginia, you know, we kind of um, are looked at as a blue state at the national level, but really at the state level, um, I would call us sort of more of a red to purple state. Um, when I first started working legislative sessions, I was told, um, you know, geographically in the state, there's Nova, Northern Virginia, uh, and then there's Rova, uh, the rest of Virginia. <laughs> so I was told I lived in Rova, um, but you can't really work in Virginia without having a left-right coalition. Um, right now, our top ticket seats um, are all Democrat, but the legislature itself is majority Republican. So that, that sort of sets the equation for you that you have to solve. Um, and Virginia itself, I really feel like is sort of five distinct states in a way. You know, we have huge rural swaths, we have um, heavy military areas, we have urban areas, we have um, a pretty resourced and wealthy Northern Virginia area that has its own sort of masked problems underneath there that often get neglected because people think of it as a wealthy area. Um, and so working within that state, you can't talk about poverty or the decriminalization of poverty um, without talking about conservative represented areas as well. And I think I'm pretty fortunate in the work that we do that the Republicans in our legislature um, welcome me into their offices and we have great conversations all the time about poverty issues. Um, this was one that really easily broke through. And if you met Senator Stanley earlier today, I always say, um, you know, the first thing you need is a good idea and the second thing you need is a good patron. And he, within a couple of minutes, um, you know, my, my colleague Pat Levy LaBelle is in the room. We went down to pitch this idea to Senator Stanley in the first year, a few years ago. Um, within 30 seconds, he was sold. It was like, we have to repeal this. He saw it every day in his office. It made total sense, it made fiscal sense. Um, and so the partnership that we forged with Americans for Prosperity really just reflected that, that we had these sort of core values underneath. Um, our goal. We all wanted people to provide for their families. We wanted people to be able to go to work. We didn't want people in prison that didn't belong there. Um, and in Virginia, we have about um, 8 million people, um, about 6 million of which are drivers, and we had nearly 1 million people um, with one of these court debt suspensions. One in six drivers in the state. It's an immense problem. 
Um, and part of the kind of aha moment we were seeing from people on both sides of the aisle was just recognizing the scope of that. Um, at the General Assembly, you know, the, the woman who was the receptionist for Senator Stanley during the session, her husband um, was under a suspension and couldn't get onto his military base as a contractor um, at the front gate because he didn't have a valid license to show. So this was something we were encountering in every corner of the state um, we had really solid arguments. There really wasn't an argument against it. You know, we were up against kind of this boogeyman, the specter of, well, people won't pay if you don't do something like take their license away. But that's, it's a myth. You can't prove a negative, right? What we could prove um, is that we had decades of this policy and a million people were under a suspension. Um, they couldn't get out from under their debt and that suggests a policy change. Wonderful. So Mark, you have been a national leader in forging ideologically diverse coalitions. And I'm actually interested in the nitty gritty of how some of these coalitions work. So in particular, I know there are a few states now that have these smart on crime coalitions. I was wondering if you could just quickly tell us like what that is and then how those are structured in a way that can really make these coalitions successful in achieving policy change. Yes, well, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, it really is true, you know, that matter of justice, it's not a matter of right or left. And uh, uh, so in Texas, we have the Smart on Crime Coalition. Um, and oh, looks like um, there we go. In Texas, we have the Smart on Crime Coalition. And uh, basically, we not only include kind of right and left groups, but you know, goodwill. Well, I don't know if they're right or left or not, but they're interested in, you know, people being able to have opportunities. Um, and Texas Association of Business, which is the Chamber of Commerce, um, also religious groups, the Catholic Conference, uh, a Baptist uh, Association in Texas. So there's non-traditional uh, constituencies for these types of reforms. Businesses need people to be able to get to their jobs. Um, you know, religious groups obviously come at it from a redemption perspective. So um, as far as how the coalition operates, it's by consensus, and I think that helps a great deal. Every organization, all the founding members have to agree in the Texas Smart on Crime Coalition that we're gonna take on a certain legislative priority. And in this most recent session, ending the driver responsibility program, which had led to millions of uh, suspensions, was one of our top priorities, and thankfully it did go through. Um, and so uh, one of the other things, of course, is each group can still do its own separate bills that aren't coalition priorities, so uh, that works very well. And then the other thing that's important I think these coalitions to understand is, you know, sometimes one group is a better messenger for a particular lawmaker. So we don't necessarily, there's not a sense that every member has to be represented in every meeting and all of that. We make strategic choices about which group would be uh, the best messenger for that audience. Um, and in the case of Texas and the driver responsibility program, I mean, nobody liked it. But the problem was, how do you pay for uh, the, it was, you know, tens of millions of dollars to trauma care hospitals. In fact, a lot of the money was diverted just to balance the budget as a accounting trick, but some of the money still did go to the trauma care hospital. So it was a matter of finding how do we replace that. And we actually sat down as a coalition with the Association for Trauma Care Hospitals, and we were able to uh, work things out. Um, so, you know, I, I think that we've won the argument, as of course all of you have heard today from the speakers so far, that the current policy uh, makes no sense on any uh, financial, moral, or other grounds, but actually, uh, changing the law clearly does require, um, uh, I think, both sides working together as well as, um, you know, dealing with the nitty gritty of, of the revenue aspect. Great. So, Amy, let me just pick up on the money point. So, how did money become an issue in Virginia, and what was the interesting way that you used to get around those concerns? Sure. Well, money is always an issue in Virginia, <laughs> but it's hard, it's hard to put a bill in and not get a fiscal note on it. But we had sort of a similar experience, it sounds like, to Texas, too, where at some point in, in Virginia's history, you know, our, our, budget, our budget goes through the legislative session as a bill. It's law, like any other law, for the duration that it lives. Um, and within that, you know, in our first year of trying to repeal driver's license suspension, you know, once you kind of turn over that rock, you start finding all the ways that criminal law is connected to revenue. Um, and in our first year, this is what we got blindsided by, that um, not so much the court debt itself, but the DMV reinstatement fees were tied to something called the trauma fund, um, which provided a revenue stream for our hospitals to offer indigent care at all of our trauma centers. 
Um, ostensibly, there was a nexus somewhere in the history of the code, if you think about um, folks with DUIs or reckless driving or sort of creating traumas on the road. Um, there was some sort of thought put to, you should be contributing financially to the care at those centers. Well, our court debt suspension folks weren't a part of that, right? They had no nexus to that fund. Um, but that fund was receiving eight or nine million dollars from these reinstatement fees every year. Um, and you can make the best ideological argument in the world. You can show how all the math works. Um, but when you hit the money committees, you have to show them how they're going to fill the gap that you're trying to um, pull from the budget. And part of what we did, um, I recommend this highly to every state, we had a, a data wizard named Ben Schoenfeld um, who was kind of magical at going into all of our court system um, databases and really looking at uh, what the economic impact was of driver's license suspension policy. You know, we had an eight or nine million dollar price tag from the trauma fund that we had to overcome. One thought that we had was, well, maybe we can show how the state is actually spending much more than that, um, just enforcing this policy and having this policy. And we started taking a look at not just the folks who were suspended, but of course, in Virginia and like many states, you have to drive those folks were accruing driving on suspended charges. Um, in Virginia, your third offense driving on suspended lands you 10 days in jail, mandatory. So um, we looked at our, our data. We're actually able to find these folks and show um, not just that their debt was increasing each time they were racking up these driving on suspended charges, um, but also when they were landing in jail, that's a cost, right? We had people in our jails that didn't belong there, but that also had an expense associated with it. And we were able to put a value to that um, and to show that actually, you know, for every $9 million generated for the trauma fund from these reinstatements, um, Virginia was spending $15, $16 million just on the jail days. Our folks were spending an average of 23 to 25 days in jail based on driving on suspended charges where the suspension was purely a court debt suspension. Um, that has a monetary value. There's a monetary value to the law enforcement resources. Um, there's a monetary value to the judicial expense of having thousands and thousands of these driving on suspended cases on dockets and having to deal with that. Um, so that is the argument we brought to the governor. Um, despite sort of partisan influence. Um, if you want to make a change in the budget in Virginia, you have to start with the governor's budget um, and work from there and then work to keep, um, keep the item in the budget or manipulate it during the session. Um, but we made that argument to the governor's office um, and he did go back in and sort of backfill that trauma fund. And that cleared one barrier. That was sort of the year one barrier that we were able to overcome. Um, but it was really important to make the case, I think, for that as its own policy change in a way, regardless of whether the bill for repealing suspension was successful or not. Um, we shouldn't sort of be tying these fees together in a way that Virginia then was sort of anticipating and relying on its citizens um, not paying their debts and then having to come back in and pay a reinstatement fee. So it was this very sort of um, nonsensical way of creating a revenue source. Um, once you create a revenue source, it's really hard to cut it off. But I think when we sort of showed the absurdity of it, it started to make sense to folks. Great. So Mark, you are oftentimes making the case about driver's license suspension to people who are conservative. What's your pitch? Well, I mean, I think we've heard it. I don't think anyone could have said it better than Senator Stanley, but, you know, the driving is a matter of liberty, especially in a state as big as Texas, Montana. You know, it's spread out. You need to do that to be able to uh, get to your job, to take care of your family. I mean, what about children of a parent who's had their, I mean, it's obviously we all know about children of incarcerated parents, and I, obviously that's even a worse situation, but, you know, uh, you need to be able to pick up your child at daycare. Um, and so we're punishing the child as well. Obviously, you hit on the jail costs, um, and, you know, it also distorts law enforcement priorities, as we heard earlier. Earlier, it leads to you know uh, focusing not on public safety but on where we can collect revenue. Um, budgets of cities and counties become overly reliant on this, and then they use that money to expand government further. So how can that be conservative? Um, 
you know, one of the other things that is overlooked is often if you don't have a valid driver's license, you can't get insurance. Now, we know about half of the folks who have their driver's license suspended, they drive anyway for the necessities that we talked about. And, uh, but their insurance might well be uh, taken away. They may not be able to obtain a policy. So that means if you or I, uh, are, you know, we have a collision with this uninsured motorist and it's their fault, it goes against our insurance. So that's also uh, undermines public safety. So uh, no matter what way you look at it, it just doesn't make any sense. And on the, on the revenue issue, one thing that's very interesting is as you look at the numbers, you find it's not really collecting what you think it is because these jurisdictions are spending a fortune on the collections process, hiring outside collections agencies. In Texas, we had 11 FTEs at our State Department of Public Safety to run this uh, uh, driver's license, uh, driver responsibility program. And for those of you who don't know a little bit about DRP, basically if you have a single DWI or if you had three or more moving violations within 12 months, uh, your license was suspended unless you could come up with thousands of dollars in surcharges. Um, now, uh, the, what happened is we completely got rid of it, the program, and for the DWI side of it, it shifted to just being um, a surcharge, but nothing to do with your driver's license suspension beyond what you already get for a DWI. So, but for the majority of people in the program, we're not DWI. And those 1.4 million people got their licenses restored on September 1st of this year. So, great victory. Um, and I should say, I mean, a lot of folks were involved in it in Texas besides us and the Smart on Crime Coalition. But uh, uh, I think that, um, and, the, and the key thing about it was we wiped away the arrears for everyone who, it was, obviously so many people can pay it. And that goes back to what I was saying before is, um, you know, you're not going to, you're going to spend all this effort going after people and there's absolutely no way they can do it. Now, the good thing is even on the DWI side where it became a surcharge, we had the legislation we helped pass in 2017, which was a general debtor's prison bill uh, that said a number of things, but including the court should adjust at the front end. Uh, before that legislation, uh, when someone was couldn't, uh, you know, they got behind on a traffic ticket and a warrant was issued for their arrest because they hadn't paid, uh, then eventually the court could adjust it. But what this legislation did is say for uh, tickets and, and other Class C misdemeanors, the court can adjust the fines and fees at the outset of the case based on a person's ability to pay, based on, uh, you know. And so the, I think the challenge that we see in this whole area is um, for a lot of, some conservatives initially look at this like, well, you got into the justice system and now we, we take you as you find you and if you didn't have money, you shouldn't have done what was wrong. But, you know, what I would say is, look at the disparate impact it has. I mean, anyone in this room, uh, uh, for the most part, or certainly anyone that works at the law firm we're at, right, they pay, get a speeding ticket, I mean, it's a bad day. You pay $175 and that's the end of it. But to think that that could lead to you know, the deprivation of liberty by jail, by not being able to drive, and all the cascading consequences from that on your family, that is, and we can't shy away from the fact that it's the government that's doing this in all of our names. So we are, at the end of the day, imposing a much different punishment on someone based on uh, their wherewithal, based on their financial resources. So um, we do believe in accountability. We have, you know, community service. Uh, obviously, people can be put on payment plans and so forth. Um, but we have to go back to the fact that these are, you know, uh, th these are issues that, um, sure, people that are wealthier can afford a, a, a nicer car. That's one thing. But we're talking about basic liberty to be able to live your life, to be able to get to a job, to get to your a higher education, to get to medical care and all of that. So I think uh, that's why conservatives, in addition to those on the left, have embraced this. Fantastic. So I want to skip right over to you, Tara. So, Tara, your organization, I should say our organization, Civil Rights Corps, uh, brought litigation in Tennessee that produced some pretty remarkable results on debt-based driver's license suspension. And I also know that Tennessee passed some legislation this term that somewhat addressed this issue. Would you mind telling us a little bit about this litigation and what happened in Tennessee? Um, thank you, Thea. Um, so along with our partners, the National Center for Law and Economic Justice, uh, Just City, and Baker Donaldson, we brought suit in Tennessee to challenge two statutory regimes. Uh, the statutory regime governing driver's license suspensions, um, and which sort of covered suspension for traffic, what we call traffic debt, traffic fines and fees, um, and the, the, re the statutory regime that governed revocation. In the revocation scheme, 
basically your driver's license was revoked if you didn't pay your quote unquote what we call court debt, um, which was the debt that you racked up um, if you were prosecuted. So if you had a criminal case, uh, you owed debt to the state for the privilege of prosecuting you. And if you did not pay that debt within a year, your driver's license was revoked. Um, and just to, to highlight a couple of, of stories, um, one, you know, our, one of our uh, plaintiffs in the driver's license revocation case um, was homeless and one night sought shelter under a bridge um, because it was raining. And he was prosecuted for trespass. And he was, he pled and he was convicted of trespass uh, and then subsequently owed debt uh, for, for having been convicted. Um, and because he was homeless, never received the notices, and ultimately his driver's license was revoked. I think it's sort of a telling story um, about the circumstances under which people can, can have their licenses revoked. Um, and so we brought suit to challenge both statutes, and our revocation, the case challenging revocation proceeded first, and we ultimately won in the district court a final judgment saying that the statute was unconstitutional. And it was pretty remarkable because the judge um, was constrained to, in, in this particular uh, jurisdiction, was constrained to apply rational basis review, uh, which is very, very deferential. And so under this review, you look at the statute and, and um, you, you know, the courts essentially say that you um, ascribe any reason that the state can give is pretty much good enough for the statute to pass muster. But, the, but our judge found that um, the statute was unconstitutional because it was irrational, and it was irrational because it was so counterproductive that it was actually at odds with any rationale that the state could provide um, for why it existed. And she had, she looked at a sort of voluminous record of the need to drive in Tennessee. Tennessee has very, very bad public transportation, even in the, the dense, you know, sort of urban areas in the cities. Um, you basically need a car to get anywhere in Tennessee. And she looked at all of the data on how crucial a car was to do virtually any, to perform any of life's necessities uh, in Tennessee. And, um, and, uh, and also looked at all of the reasons that you would need a car to work. And you know, economic self-sufficiency was a really big part of her opinion. The fact that you can't actually go to a job to make the money to pay off the debt that you owe if you don't have a driver's license um, was really kind of crucial to her counterproductivity sort of conclusion. Um, and so, so we won that case and we, we, um, in, in the district court. And um, she issued an injunction. and, and the state was re required to halt uh, revocations uh, pending sort of development of a plan to, to, do, uh, to, to assess ability to pay, essentially. Um, the suspension case proceeded on a slightly slower timeline, but ultimately we won a preliminary injunction in that case as well, proceeding on essentially the same um, sort of reasoning. Her, she it was the same judge and she had the same reasoning as to why debt-based suspension was equally counterproductive as, as debt-based revocation. Uh, so two victories that were great. Um, the the, the um, Tennessee legislature then passed um, a statute that addressed both debt-based revocation and debt-based suspension. And, um, and sort of developed, the, the Tennessee legislature's response was, was not to get rid of debt-based revocation, debt-based suspension, but rather to create a very, un, to my mind, unwieldy bureaucratic infrastructure for courts and clerks to conduct um, ability to pay determinations and impose payment plans, um, all of which sort of nominally addresses this point that you know people's ability to pay um, is is crucial to the determination of um, whether you can take their license away or not from from a legal perspective, um, but creates a number of problems just in terms of the enforcement of it and, and um, any indiv indigent individual's ability to ta actually take advantage of it. So that's sort of where we are now. Great, I'm gonna come back to that in a moment, but would love to go to you, Ariel. So your organization achieved some wonderful legislation last year, ending mm -hmm. driver's license suspension for unpaid debt. You did this without litigating. But I understand that you view the threat of litigation as something that was really important in the work that you were doing. So I was just wondering if you would explaining, mind explaining for us how you see litigation and policy working together. Sure, thanks. That's a great question. So hi, I'm Ariel Levinson-Waldman with Static DC. 
turning my microphone on. <laughs> uh, we're a public interest center headquartered at the UDC David A. Clark School of Law, which produced such alums as Senator Stanley, working next door in Virginia. So there's, there's an exciting nexus. Uh, and I'll talk more about the interstate nexus when we get to the Tennessee Dis District of Columbia nexus, which has been exciting as well. Um, for both the litigation and the parallel uh, legislative strategies, uh, I think the building blocks have so much in common. Uh, and the building blocks uh, for each involve data, human stories that are compelling, and framing the unconstitutionality of the jurisdiction's practice. We did all of those three things with an eye towards teeing up a conversation uh, with our government officials about which path this would be resolved through. And it was going and will be resolved through one of these two paths, the legislative reform process and or the courts, right? These are the key toolkits in our collective and all the different amazing groups we're hearing from today in our collective toolkits. So we gathered data. We FOIA'd. We revealed in a jurisdiction that is quite small uh, less than 710,000 people, adults and kids, 126,000 residents had had their licenses suspended for unpaid debts in the prior years. We saw that the arrests of District of Columbia residents were in the thousands, and that in a jurisdiction where less than half of our residents are African American, 80% of the arrests for driving without a license are in our African American neighbors. We generated data uh, that folks are being denied the ability to renew their license as distinct, as importantly distinct from receiving a suspension of the license. We have a separate statute in DC that says you can't renew your license if you owe the government for any reason $100 or more. And we generated data through oversight requests uh, that our allies in the legislature put in that revealed that there are 180,000 outstanding tickets that disqualify people from being able to renew their license. Again, this is a jurisdiction of just about 700,000 people. These numbers are shocking with respect to the percentage of adults who cannot drive lawfully and who are subject to the risks of arrest and the pathologies of the criminal justice system that come from, that we've heard a lot about today, that come from the record. That's a little bit on the data piece. But the human piece is so important as well. We had residents come to a a transportation committee oversight hearing and tell stories like one or one Ward 8 resident who I was blown away by who told a story about how she hadn't had enough money to pay the ticket, she hadn't had uh, cash on hand when the ticket doubled, she received a notice of suspension and a couple of weeks later she got an emergency call from her that her mom had been medevaced to Johns Hopkins which is up the way in Baltimore and she told the story of sitting in front of her car in tears and trying to make the choice, do I drive to be with my mom at this time of crisis and maybe, maybe not get arrested and deal with all those problems, or do I follow the, uh, the new legal regime of my license been taken away? She made the human choice that Mark referred to and others have as well, that more than half of our neighbors make, which is, you know what, I gotta live my life, and I gotta go be with my mom in this time of crisis. And she, rec she recalled that story uh, to the committee, and it changed the mood of the entire discussion. Uh, which so often begins with, well, aren't these just freeloaders who are taking away our revenue sources? And that's, of course, so the wrong frame for all the reasons you've heard about today. So that was all teed up. We then uh, worked with, we have the benefit, and not every jurisdiction has the benefit of this. We have a benefit of a, an attorney general who really gets it. Uh, and we met uh, intensively with Attorney General Racine and his team, uh, and he came out publicly in support of the legislation. We met with colleagues in the executive office of the mayor, which Thea knows a little bit about here in the district. Uh, and we had some terrific conversations with the mayor's team. And so this was teed up ultimately for two really outstanding leaders in our council, Alyssa Silverman and Mary Che, to be able to champion through. We ended suspensions full stop for unpaid traffic debt in the District of Columbia. And immediately by statute, 65,000 people had their licenses restored. That is a good thing. We lost on the renewal issue. No change whatsoever occurred. Those same 65,000 people uh, were more or less immediately subject to the exact same risk, but we identify uh, as essentially a slow motion suspension. That's still the law under this horribly unfair named statutory provision in the district called the Clean Hands Law, which places a moral judgment on every single person who lacks the ability to pay. And so that is the next step in our fight that is ongoing. 
We are in active conversations. We benefit, uh, like uh, Tara's team, with working with some terrific law firms. And here we're, we've been partnered with Wilmer, Wilmer Hare and Venable. What's the Tennessee connection? When we went to testify to the legislature, we said, by the way, the data is terrible. This is awful for people's financial futures. This is a violation of basic racial justice principles. You should know that what the district is doing is also constitutional. And we just read aloud from the terrific district court opinion that Tara and her colleagues had generated uh, in Tennessee. So there's a great uh, kind of inter-jurisdiction uh, inter uh, dynamism going on in this issue. Only one court of appeals in the whole country, the Sixth Circuit, has ruled on the merits. These are open issues. There are great victories to be had when these issues can get teed up in the right way uh, in the courts. And meanwhile, uh, the legislatures, if you can get a win, a uh, clean win through the legislatures, uh, that is certainly a better way to go because of the uncertainties always of litigation. And I'll pause there. If you have one piece of advice for an organization that is thinking about litigation versus policy, what is perhaps like one consideration that they should think through before deciding what to do? I guess litigation versus policy. I mean, I think the receptiveness of your forum is always going to play a part in your calculations. Um, you know, there are courts that will be more receptive and there will be legislatures that will be more receptive. I think that's sort of a fairly obvious point. Um, but from the, from the litigation side, I think, you know, it's, it's true that, um, you know, one great way to draw attention to an issue is to, you know, go and make a federal case out of it. Um, but the, the, the sort of model, the federal class action model, isn't the only model for, for generating change. Um, I've you know, talked to folks who are considering um, you know, challenges in the state courts. There are state constitutions that are often more expansive um, and have been interpreted more expansively in the states than the federal constitution has. Um, there are um, ways to incorporate the constitutional arguments that we made in the driver's license cases into, you know, into the criminal process and arguing on you know, sentencing issues. There are many, many, many ways in which uh, a debt-based suspension or suspension for non-payment um, can really um, play a part in someone's criminal um, conviction or criminal history as well in ways that you wouldn't anticipate. So there are, there are just a, a lot of different um, ways to think through you know, how to use the constitutional arguments in creative ways um, with different partners, with public defenders, with you know, community organizations, with um, state legislatures. Um, you know, there are a lot of different ways to, to deploy those arguments, and I think being really creative um, and aggressive about it is important. Fantastic. So, Ariel, coming back to you, just wondering briefly, we heard before that Tara felt that the legislation ultimately passed in Tennessee was below the bottom line that she had in terms of what good policy looks like. In D.C., the legislation that ultimately passed was less than what you wanted, but you viewed it as something that's positive and as the base for moving forward toward deeper reforms. So I was wondering if you could just talk through a little bit this issue of how people should think about setting their bottom lines and how you feel that you can leverage an incremental change to get the full reform that you're looking for. It's a, it's a great question, and I actually don't think there's any one-size-fits-all answer. Um, I think that... Um, for folks advocating at the state or local level, uh, you are going to uh, have the context uh, and the access uh, and, the, and the data and kind of lay of the land to be able to make your own judgments. But key factors in those judgments are certainly going to include what's the mood in the legislature? Do we have the appetite and relationship such that we could have a multi-year, multi-step reform process? Or is this a one-shot deal? That's something you, you would need to have a, a real capture on. Um, I think, um, you know, there's this great concept from negotiation theory, the best alternative to a negotiation agreement, BOTNA. You got it here, your best alternative is the courts. You need to know what's the governing law in your jurisdiction, what's, what's happening uh, uh, elsewhere in terms of the litigation, how seriously you can go to your AG uh, with a threat that says, if we don't work this out uh, in the legislature, we're going to have to go to the courts. I think the good news is, in most jurisdictions, this is still a serious threat. Uh, that can be made, and there are serious arguments to be made that the failure to inquire as to the person's ability, person's ability to pay is unconstitutional. Um, I think all, all of those sort of factor in, um, but the, you know, I, I am a great believer uh, that uh, a win can be a win, uh, regardless of the fact that it's imperfect. The, the good, the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. Uh, and in the district, uh, 
we, unlike some other sort of stickier situations, it was a net positive. There was an immediate positive result. It just wasn't as positive as the arguments we had, uh, the outcome we had been advocating for. But it, what it has done is also teed up an argument that to the legislature, uh, which our, co our coalition is in the process of making, uh, which is simply that you've already made this policy choice to stop taking away people's driver's licenses as a result of their lack of wealth. Uh, and outstanding debt, and what you need to do is simply clean up this weird loophole, uh, this sort of idiosyncratic loophole that has been left uh, where a slow motion suspension uh, is still authorized even though the fast one uh, you've ended. Fantastic. So it doesn't seem like I have any questions, so I'm just gonna pose one more to our panel, but if that isn't correct and you have a last minute question, then this is your moment, so just like quickly get it to Priya. So I would love to just hear very briefly one of the other issues that advocates come up against is what to actually advocate for. Do they advocate for a clean repeal, which means getting rid of the state's authority to completely suspend debt base, to, to suspend driver's licenses based on debt? Or do they try to go for something more incremental, like requiring an ability to pay inquiry before the suspension happens? When we sort of sparked our legislative campaign, we wanted to make sure we were never undermining our own litigation. Um, and there you know, were deals that were brought to us. There were proposals that were brought to us um, that we ultimately rejected and just went all in on clean repeal, um, both because that supported the goals of our litigation as well, but also um, you know, we, had ex we had explored other options in Virginia, adding 970,000 ability to pay hearings to our court dockets was untenable. The price tag on that was astronomical. Um, the complications of figuring out what that meant in terms of due process and notice and all of those requirements was exceedingly complicated. And to go in and try to pitch that to a legislator in a literal elevator speech um, was just really problematic. And so it's much easier to go in um, in this regard, it's sort of nice that the constitutional argument is the simplest and the one that makes most sense at a practical level that people get right away. When you say, you know, you can't pay a debt if you can't get into your car and drive to your job, people get that immediately on a really personal level. Um, and so for us, repeal in the Virginia Code was the only, was the only answer. Um, you know, our legislative efforts are still live. Our litigation is very much still live. And so I think that is the ultimate goal. Um, usually in policy, you know, I expect to have three, four, five years of working on something um, in, a, in a good issue. Um, so we knew that there would be several years of work on this. Um, and so why not hold out and, and go for the whole thing? When they say people respond to incentives, our response was yes, and there are many other incentives that we could use to leverage for the same result. Number one, number two, that those incentives don't have to come with these unintended consequences. Another sort of language that people on the right understand and can speak in when it comes to economic phenomena. Second. Uh -huh. <laughs> that is what I was expecting, that lockstep. <laughs> 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 